Hey guys, and welcome to a walk-in Wednesday. Today, I am bringing you a storied gun that uh, is surrounded by mystique. So I know when I do this video, I'm gonna get a lot of comments saying that's not true, that's not true. I'm gonna give you my truth. <laughs> no, really, they, because this was uh, part of a secret clandestine operation, there are a lot of uh, references to they were never distributed, yes they were, no they weren't. There are stories of people who say they were distributed, and then there's stories saying those are all made up stories. Uh, this is called The Liberator, and it was part of a clandestine operation by the United States Army. Well, it started out from the United States Army. It was an idea of a joint task force of Army officers. Uh, they came up with the idea for this. They were made by Guide Lamp Corporation, which is a division of General Motors. Uh, their factory is in Indiana. Um, you can see a picture of the factory here. And before the war, they made lamps or uh, the uh, lights for cars, for General Motors. But most of you probably know, during the war, all production of cars ceased, and they turned, uh, turned the factories into war materials uh, for World War II. So uh, Guide Lamp had no contracts other than to make lamps. They, did, uh, con they made other things, but it was all stamped sheet metal. And uh, they did continue making lamps for Jeeps and tanks and things like that. But they got a contract from the U.S. Army to make one million of these Liberators. Guide Lamp not only made these uh, cheap guns, but they also made the very famous uh, grease gun, uh, which was very popular in World War II, uh, part particularly in the Pacific Theater. Um, the grease gun, or also known as the M3, you can see here, uh, is, is iconic and you probably recognize it right away from different war movies. But that was also made by Guide Lamp uh, from stamp sheet metal. Very cheap, but in this case it was a very, it was a very durable weapon. Now the actual nomenclature, uh, the military called this the FP45. It's a 45 caliber. What does FP stand for? It stands for flare pistol. And that's because, again, they were keeping this operation so secret, they didn't even want the workers to know that they were making guns. They told them these are flare pistols, or they shot flare projectiles. They, in fact, shoot a 45 caliber bullet. Um, there is no rifling in here because it is meant to be a point-blank range uh, gun. And again, the clandestine part of it, they were, the, the plan was to drop these, parachute them behind enemy lines throughout occupied Europe and occupied Asia, uh, the resistance fighters would pick them up. Uh, it's designed to have one shot. Uh, you would go up to a sentry who has to have an MP40 on him. You pull this out, you shoot the sentry, and take his MP40 and leave this behind. It's a throwaway gun. Uh, the instructions said you should not shoot it more than five times, and that's because they're afraid this thing will fall apart. Let me show you a little bit about how it operates. By the way, I have a Variation 1 here. This has some goodies in it, I'll get to that. Variation one had the guide rod um, on, on the exterior and that would tend to bend and then it wouldn't shoot properly. So variation two, they made this improvement. Um, they made one million of these in 11 weeks. It was generally 300 women, you know, there are uh, men there too, but 300 women made one million of these, uh, again, stamped sheet metal uh, in 11 weeks. Amazing, uh, amazing. Uh, manufacturing uh, and motivation. The original cost was just a little over two dollars a gun. What I read on the internet was um, that they they held five rounds but in fact this one holds eight rounds. I can barely get them out and these are live rounds so the person that brought this in walked in with it. <laughs> the walk-in guy brought them with live rounds inside but fortunately I'm not gonna pull those out. You pull this back, lift, and there was also a wooden dowel that came where you would just pop, pop out the round. Now this is a dummy round. So all you do is pop this in, drop this down. You walk up to a guard and say, uh, excuse me, can you show me your papers? And it fires a 45, uh, 45 caliber bullet. Um, point blank, but people, if you go on the internet, there are people, crazy people who don't care about their hands. Uh, they, uh, there are people who shoot these and they say it's accurate up to about 20 feet and after that the bullet begins to roll. Again, there's no, there's no rifling, uh, very inaccurate, uh, very cheaply made. Uh, there also was a guy who uh, tested these out 
Um, they wanted to see how many rounds they could put through, uh, put through this gun. He was able to put about 50 rounds through this gun before it started. The rivets started breaking. This started pulling apart. The gun literally fell apart after 50 rounds. So they recommended you only use it, you know, five to eight times um, and then just throw it away. I miss the German. Yeah. Okay, let's try this again. I need a stick. I need an ejector. All right, ejector. Reload. So single shot, uh, secret operation, U.S. Army idea, but they sent a half a million over to England and the other half a million were destined for Asia. When they got to England, the British didn't like it. I, maybe it wasn't very gentlemanly to do this. Uh, Eisenhower didn't like the idea. So consequently, they sat in warehouses and were not used. And generally, the same thing happened in Asia. For whatever reason, uh, the senior officers didn't like the idea of parachuting these things behind enemy lines. I think they were thinking down the road, this could come back to bite us. That's the only thing I can think of. Because you can imagine uh, dropping a million of these <laughs> randomly in the United States, things are gonna go wrong. So uh, they didn't really do it. Uh, so what ended up happening, the OSS, which was the predecessor of the CIA, OSS, Secret Operations, this is probably one of their most famous or infamous operations. They were able to take these and distribute them uh, to the occupied countries. There are people who say that never happened. There are people who said in France and Greece, they know for a fact that it happened because OSS officers who were sworn to secrecy have said that they did distribute these in France and uh, Greece. In Asia, they were distributed to the Philippines, China, and uh, India. And again, uh, OSS officers uh, clandestinely uh, distributed these guns, and they were used, but very, very rarely. The vast majority of the one million were destroyed or dumped into the ocean at the end of the war. Interestingly, after the war was over, in the poorer countries like China, India, and uh, the Philippines, uh, we know in the Philippines they were distributed to the police as a gun to be used by the police after the war. Again, very poor countries. They have these guns that were given to them during the war. Uh, they use them, they're accurate up to uh, 20 feet. So if you're a, a criminal in, in the Philippines and the police have one of these, you wanna make sure you run fast enough that you're at least 20 feet ahead of the law. Um, so uh, let's go uh, with what else came with this. This came with an original box that looked like this. And the gun fit inside. Again, there was a wooden dowel that's not here. Would be easy to, to make one. Oh, they do make repros of this. Uh, the repros look exactly like this, but they look brand new. So make sure you, uh, if you want to make sure you have an original, uh, this is what it looks like and it should show age. This one does. But the instructions, also very cool because if you're dropping these in occupied uh, countries, it, you know, uh, they all speak different languages. The instructions are all cartoon type characters. Take a look at that. No instructions in writing. So any, any people group, could quickly figure out how to use this gun. And here's the only instruction. It's called instructions. Um, here's how you can tell uh, the real ones. If you hold this up to a, a light, you can see a watermark. In sections seven and nine, you can see the watermark behind it. The reproductions, uh, you, you wanna watch out for reproductions, they will not have the watermark. Now that I said that, the, the people who do these will figure out a way to put a watermark on it. But that's how you can generally tell that these are original. And uh, by the way, these $2 guns, uh, today this, this whole assembly would, would cost about uh, $4,000 to $5,000. Just the gun, I, I've picked up the guns. You'll see, look, look, look at this one, the top of this. You can see how crudely these are made. It's just, these are very crudely made, but you, I, I have sold the gun uh, just by itself in, uh, for about $2,000. And by the way, they disappear very quickly. They're very hard to find because I said most of them were destroyed at the end of the war. When they come in, they sell right away. They don't last on my site very long at all. Um, so that is the Liberator, the FP-45, not a flare pistol, but a clandestine pistol. Uh, thanks for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe. Tell your friends about us. If you're like me and you can't get enough of this stuff, click here to subscribe. That way we'll send you notification when we do something new or click one of these buttons for recommended videos.